Our goal here is that you will fear less and enjoy more the food that you eat. And trust me, it's possible. <laughs> It's seven o'clock in the evening, and you make your way through the grocery store aisle. Half the items in your cart weren't on the list, you're pretty sure of that, but it's dinner time, and snacks are looking pretty good. As you pay the cashier, you recall, there is a reason you're not supposed to shop for food when you're hungry. Nobody wants to overeat. We all understand that overeating can lead to weight gain, obesity, and chronic diseases, and that we should be thoughtful and deliberate in our choices of what to buy and consume. Many of us think that the decisions we make are under our control, but the truth is, they're often not. In the real world of our daily lives, many important decisions are made automatically by reflex without that much thought. Too often these quick decisions actually run counter to our stated goals or deepest desires. But it's not our fault, it's our brain's fault. According to Daniel Kahneman, Nobel Prize laureate and author of Thinking Fast and Slow, we have a fast thinking part of our brain and a slow thinking part. The fast thinking part gets us through our days. Making gut decisions about most of the choices we have to make. The slow thinking part. Does the heavy lifting when it comes to deep consideration and hard decisions. It also does the math. The slow thinking part is lazy it won't do the deep thinking unless it has to. And key, it's also easily fatigued. All right, making choices about what to buy and eat. It's probably not as tough as designing a nuclear reactor or calculating flight trajectories of a rocket, but it still takes a mental toll. The human brain gets tired after an intense round of decision making or after a long day of making choices. When this happens, our brains lean towards whichever option feels easiest. And this is seldom the best option for our health. The good, healthy choices tend to require a little more thoughtful consideration. We have a lot on our minds these days though, and we are already overwhelmed with too many choices. When it comes to shopping, it's often too difficult to check all the labels and research each product we put in our cart at the grocery store. If it feels like things are getting harder, it's because they are. And it's not just because our lives have gotten busier, though they have, it's because we are faced with so many more choices today than we have ever had in the past. It's overwhelming. Rewind the clock to 1980 and consumers went into the grocery store and really didn't face any more daunting challenges than whether to buy Prego tomato sauce or Ragu tomato sauce. There weren't too many other options, but by the end of the 1980s, things had changed dramatically. Each of those brands was offering a wide array of sauce varieties from, you know, chunky, spicy, zesty, and everything in between. And on top of this, the number of competitors was beginning to explode as well. And this story is the same for barbecue sauces, salad dressings, pickles, and dozens and dozens of other products. In fact, more than 112,000 new items reached the supermarket shelves during the 1980s, including many new sizes and flavors of existing products. Even now, the challenge gets harder every day because the number of options we have in the supermarket is constantly growing. Dealing with all this is a mental burden that people didn't have to shoulder in the past. And yet another layer of complexity is added by the popular new wrinkle of online grocery shopping. Most of us are still going to the brick and mortar stores to buy our groceries, but online food and beverage sales are rising. And Nielsen Total projects that by 2025, they will hit $143 billion, accounting for a substantial 18% of all grocery shopping. And think about it, the only thing actually limiting the amount of products you have in your local grocery store is the amount of shelf space. There's infinite room on virtual shelves well, that has the potential to really overload consumers already dizzy at the variety of options available today. Prepackaged guilty snacks are easy to purchase via on-screen icons, whereas healthy vegetables are best selected by hand in person. So online buyers may be more likely to delay their vegetable purchases until they have time to visit the store themselves. And then social media. Social media floods the online space with information, misinformation, and disinformation, contributing to this really huge dilemma about decision making. I mean, our social behavior has fundamentally changed with the advent of the internet, altering the ways that we connect as humans and impacting our herd behaviors in ways that definitely affect our diet. According to Deborah Cohen, author of A Big Fat Crisis, The Hidden Influences Behind the Obesity Epidemic and How We Can End It, we have limited thinking capacity. So as we use our brains more and more, our ability to think carefully and calculate and analyze is worn down. 
So there you go. Even if we don't go to the supermarket hungry, we can only spend so much time figuring out what to buy before our brains just become overloaded and we begin to make quick decisions based on the superficial characteristics of food, notably appearance, convenience, or labels. Hey, and guess what? Supermarkets are aware of the mental toll that shopping takes, and this is why they sell candy and chips at the cash register. Impulse buys mostly happen when our guard is down at the end of a shopping trip. Psychologists refer to this phenomena as decision fatigue. Decision fatigue refers to the deteriorating quality of the decisions we make after a long session of decision making. Intuitively, the concept does make good sense, but is there actually any evidence that we can get worn down and make choices we really don't want to? Well, it turns out, yeah, there is quite a bit of research on this topic. In one study, researchers asked people to memorize either a two-digit number or a seven-digit number and then offer participants either chocolate cake or a healthy fruit salad. The group that had that seven-digit number to memorize was much more likely, like 50% more likely, to choose the cake over the fruit salad. There's something there. It seems like our memorizing a bigger number does in fact exhaust our mental reserves, making us more likely to give into an unhealthy food choice impulse. This kind of thing also happens readily when we're asked to make trade-offs. Like having to decide between products with a positive and negative characteristic is an energy draining form of decision making. And of course, this is exactly what happens when we go shopping for food. We make dozens of decisions between fairly similar products. Even when products appear to be identical in terms of nutrition, we still have to compare prices. We also have to check the unit price to be sure which is actually a better buy. And yeah, there are also socioeconomic ramifications here too. Food choice decision fatigue affects people differently if they're rich or poor. The less money you have in your pocket, the more time and energy you need to put into every food purchase. Meanwhile, rich people don't have to think long and hard about whether or not to buy the organic or the conventional tomato. If you're rich, there's not really a choice to make. Buy the most expensive thing. As a result, the supermarket induces far more decision fatigue in the poor than in the rich because each purchase requires more mental trade-offs. And so like, fair enough, after the mental workout that occurs in supermarket aisles, it wouldn't be a surprise for somebody to pick up that candy bar as they reach for the cash register. They no longer have the energy to resist. In fact, by that time, most of us were apt to consider it a reward for the hard work of shopping clever supermarket. Decision fatigue also just takes our self-control, crumples it up, and tosses it out the window. An example of this, in yet another study, researchers showed a group of women an emotional scene from the movie Terms of Endearment. Half of them were asked to control their feelings during the scene, and the women who were told to suppress their emotions later ate 55% more ice cream than the other women. So digesting all of this, one of the most interesting aspects of this research is that it suggests that the attention placed on food by the diet industry could be leading to decision fatigue and mental fatigue, which in turn is leading us to bad decisions and a loss of control. The more the public fixates on food, the worse the problem is likely to become. So that's the problem. What's the solution? Well, there are a number of strategies that you can use to avoid finding yourselves in these decision fatigue situations. Make important decisions at the start of the day, before you're tired. Make strong commitments to pre-scheduled routines like exercise. Make a shopping list and stick to it. Keep your blood sugar steady. Don't shop when you're tired or hungry. Knowing how the brain works gives us power. Certain circumstances are always going to reduce the quality of our decisions, but planning ahead, we can sidestep much of this trouble and we can eat a lot healthier in the process. So this video and all of the other videos in this Food Fear series are actually based on a series of articles by my friend Jack Bobo over at futurityfood.com. We've been working together to get those articles into video form so that you could see them. And if you like what you're seeing here, maybe click that subscribe button and hit the like button so we can get more people to see this stuff. And as always, thank you to my patrons on Patreon. You guys help me really make up that difference month to month. Things are not easy out there right now. I appreciate that you're still out there supporting me. Thanks for watching.